Maybe. So, I'm an economic student. It's one of the subjects that I'm going to be taking from a GCSEs at the end of this year. It's one of the subjects that I enjoy. It's probably the subject that I'm best at. In fact, it, it's a subject that I love. Specifically, I love to argue against the principles of free market capitalism, which is, safe to say, a fairly strange uh, enjoyment uh, pastime for a year 11. Um, and last year, towards the end of the year, we've done, we've finished all of our exams, uh, we've, we've done most of year 10's work, uh, and we're learning a bit about financial markets, private investment, etc. Uh, and we're there watching a documentary about Warren Buffett. And I look around my class, and that is the reaction of everyone in the class. I look at them, and I think, really? This guy? This is the guy that you idolise. And at that point, I realised my economics class was devoid of a moral compass. Now, I'm seeing a lot of people here, and they're looking at me going, what have you got against Warren Buffett? What's this guy ever done to you? So why do I dislike Mr. Buffett's son? Or why does anyone dislike anyone else? because he does things of which I disapprove. Now the reason why I'm picking on Mr. Buffett so much is because he's an investor that I'm hoping quite a few people will know about, or at least have heard of. Uh, but my point stands true for everyone that's ever privately invested their money. Um, for me, at its heart, investment is about making money from the fruit of everyone else's labour. If you think about the principle of investment, it doesn't really contribute anything tangible of benefit to anyone else's life. All it really is is just moving money around, charging people extra money for giving them money. And private investors really contribute very little of benefit to society. If you look at the way that uh, the financial system works, you look at the economy as a whole, bankers are the equivalent of fiscal parasites, sucking off the profits that are made by the average person. Uh, we all want to... Okay, I'll give you an example. We all want to save for our eventual retirement, if millennials will be so lucky. But older people in the room may be looking to save for a retirement fund. Now, say you are £200 of your earnings right now. In 60 years' time, if you keep those £200 in raw cash, that will have £200 purchasing power. It will be worth the equivalent of £200 in 60 years. The only problem is, I'm sure everyone's aware, the prices gradually inflate over a period of time. In the UK in the third quarter of this year, the inflation was 2.7%. So if, assuming the inflation rate stays the same, which it roughly will because the government maintains a policy of trying to get it to as close as 3%, um, then in 60 years' time, we sh uh, those uh, £200 should be worth roughly £900. Uh, the inflation rate will mean that in 60 years' time, £200 will have the purchasing power of 930... Uh, £200 in today's money will have the purchasing power of £900. The only problem is, as I said before, if you keep those £200 in raw cash, they're still only worth £200 in the future. You've then lost out on about £700. Uh, if you were to invest it in a normal uh, individual savings account or cash ISA, uh, Barclays UK, you'd come out with about £310, which is still a £600 loss. The only outcome that could possibly mean that you have enough to survive when you were retired is if you invest. So I think I've made it fairly clear that I'm more than willing to forgive people for investing their money. We are, after all, forced to do so because of the way the economy works. But what I can't abide by is the fact that the most profitable, uh, profitable companies, companies that people invest in most, have less than moral business practices. So if you're someone like me, who has strong principles about investment, strong principles about the way the economy works, slightly leftist leanings when it comes to principles about workers' rights, etc., 
how do you reconcile those beliefs with your private investments, the investments that you are forced to take part in because of the way the economy is structured? Um, well, first I'd like to tell you a story. It's a story of greed, bad suits, and subprime mortgage candidates. So, I'm sure we've all heard of the uh, subprime mortgage crisis of 2007. I'm telling you, the only people worse at naming things, the only people worse at historians at naming things are economists. Um, so, many of you will know of the subprime mortgage crisis and everything that happened after it. But I'm willing to put my life savings on a few people struggling to know exactly what happened and how. So in the early 2000s, the US, housing, uh, the US real estate economy, uh, specifically, or in most cases, the entire world's uh, housing uh, market, was on the up. Uh, prices were gradually increasing, uh, and so, uh, along with an increase in interest rates globally, um, the economy looked to be favouring investments in real estate, and banks recognised this. So, um, Along with, this coincided with a steady drop in the price of the profits of US Treasury bonds after Clinton left the office and Bush came in, um, slowly profits from the US government declined, which meant that banks around the world started to shift away from investing in US government bonds and investing in US real estate bonds. So these were incredibly profitable, and so the banks started investing in them and invested more and more and more, and as they invested more and more and more in the US housing economy, it became more profitable. But then the banks started to get greedy. They started lending to what called subprime mortgage candidates. These are people that cannot afford a mortgage. They often hand out, uh, have already outstanding debts, they often work low paid jobs. But because the banks understood that mortgages were so profitable, they lent money to them anyway. Uh, they also used these people's subprime candidacy uh, profiles as an excuse to charge them extortionately high interest rate. Success in economics and banking as a whole is 90% confidence and 10% maths, logic, etc. And one day there was a brief shake in the housing market and that brought it all crashing to the ground. So when banks are worried that the collateral that backed up their investments was uh, becoming more and more risky, less and less pro potentially less and less profitable. What they started doing is increasing the interest rate to try and protect themselves and get a profit from the interest. The problem was the interest rate was already exorbitantly high, and that was the uh, feather that broke the camel's back. People could no longer afford to pay the interest on mortgages they'd already taken out. That caused people to perform, and as a result, cash flow dried up for a lot of major banks. What happened then is people just stopped lending to each other. When a bank is worried that they're going to lose money on one investment, why would they give it to another loaning when they're already worried about their financial situation? And now the fiscal economy, uh, sorry, fiscal economy like Britain's, for example, revolves on money moving around the system. And when that stops, that has wide-ranging effects for the entire economy as a whole. Now there was a bunch of other stuff that went on that was, com that was completely illegal, uh, including monetary lending practices, loan sharks, etc. that were operating on behalf of banks. But the important thing is that banks should never have lent to someone that they knew was a risky investment. They should never have done it because they knew that they were wrong. Now, I spent the first 10 years of my life being born and growing up in Rochdale, in Great Manchester. That is the most pleasant photo I could find on the internet of it. And I think that accurately sums up what it was like after the financial crisis. The Bible has, or Christ, the Christian faith has, a uh, principle of the seven sins, uh, wherein if you commit, things wherein if you commit them, you, you're going to hell. Um, so I come up with seven virtues of investing, seven things to look for that should guarantee you a profit whilst also helping you to reconcile your beliefs with the private investment you've gone into. 
The first is that investment should be based in a country with pro-labour and pro-environmental laws. Countries in Scandinavia and Western Europe generally have laws that are designed to protect individual workers and protect the environment. So if you're investing in a company that's based in one of these countries, uh, Siemens for example, Germany, you're fairly safe and secure in the idea that you're not giving your money to a corporation that will exploit its workers and damage the world's environment. If your company has a generally good reputation, then you can be fairly certain that you're not supplying your money to anything that is going to cost workers in Asia, the subcontinent, uh, and Africa their lives, their livelihoods, their wages, etc, etc, etc. Three, they pay their taxes. There's a lot of animosity in the UK towards large conglomerates like Amazon, Google, etc, largely tech companies, because they pay about 2% tax in the UK. For comparison, large British companies pay 21% tax, uh, business tax and smaller companies pay 19% business tax. So large foreign conglomerates who make their money in the UK are expected to pay about a tenth of what British business it is. Now, this is a problem because in the UK business tax is one of the largest contributors to the national budget. That's what we use to spend on the NHS, that's what we use uh, to pay our policemen, that's what we use to provide uh, safe, clean public transport. So when a business leverages its large and uh, its power against a country to avoid paying tax or to pay as little tax as is fiscally possible or legally possible in most cases, then it deprives the people in that country of access to an education, of access to good, high quality medical care, of access to safe and secure uh, transportation, of police protection, and military protection. Uh, number four, the investment does not rely on a demerit good. Hands up, who knows what a demerit good is? Exactly. A demerit good is a product that is inherently bad for the, uh, for the consumer, for the provider or for the society as a whole. Things like alcohol, drugs, tobacco, etc. So, this one's fairly self-explanatory. You should probably avoid giving your money to a tobacco company that you know is going to go away and sell cigarettes to someone who will get lung cancer, who will cost their health service provider, their, whether that be an insurer or a national government, thousands to insure. Um, it's just generally a good idea to stay away from companies whose name, uh, who, who have tobacco as an integral part of their name. Um, number five, the investment is not politically driven. Investments that you make to support a political party or because they support your views or because they are politically involved are generally bad ideas. 